Hello, and welcome to this virtual event on the importance of early years education. Uh, I'm Gemma Moss, Professor of Literacy and Interim Head of the Department of Learning and Leadership here at the Institute of Education. I'm delighted to be chairing this event for you this evening in which colleagues will discuss aspects of their research into early years education. First, a few quick housekeeping matters. Just to let you know, this event is being recorded so we can make it available to watch on demand afterwards. Each of our panelists will give a brief presentation on what matters to them about early years education, and we will continue the discussion via your questions. If you'd like to ask a question of the panel, please use the Q&A function. You'll find that at the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along. Sarah Bubb will be feeding questions to the panel, though we may not have time to address them all. If you'd like to tweet about the discussion, please use the hashtag IOE120. That stands for IOE's 120th anniversary celebrations. And this event is part of a series in which we're showcasing the work of each of the Institute of Education's academic departments. In the Department of Learning and Leadership, we've chosen to focus on our work on the early years as it's a key part of our activity. Uh, we range from research on children's learning through to teacher education, masters and PhD level study. It is also, of course, a vital stage in setting the foundations for future educational success, as the panel will make clear. Let me briefly introduce the panel to you. We have with us Iram Siraj, Honorary Professor at IOE, as well as holding a professorial post at the University of Oxford. Iram led the EPSI study, one of the most influential studies on effective early years practice and well known worldwide. Dr. Guy Robert Holmes, Senior Lecturer in Early Childhood Education at IOE, has written extensively on the impact of testing on young children and the governance regime that is part of that. Rachel Levy is Associate Professor in Education and a researcher of Early Years Literacy. Dr. Trevor Mayle is Senior Lecturer in Education Leadership Management and his work includes leadership in early childhood education. Claire Crawford is Associate Professor of Economics in the Centre for Education Policy and Equalising Opportunities, and her research looks at the determinants and consequences of participation in childcare and education. And finally, Dominic Wise joins us from the US. He's Professor of Early Childhood and Primary Education and runs the Helen Hamlin Centre for Pedagogy, 0 to 11 years here at IOE. Each of our panelists will provide their particular take on why the early years is important and how we can make best use of those years. I'm going to turn first to Iran. Iran. My research with colleagues at the IOE, Pam Sands, Brenda Taggart and Kathy Silver into the benefits of early education and the home learning environment has been a powerful force in shaping government policy over the last 20 years. The effective provision of preschool education, EPI, which later became EPSI, with primary and secondary follow-up included, demonstrated the potential of high quality early education and the early home learning environment to improve outcomes for children in childhood and beyond. This 17 year longitudinal study was based at the IOE for that full period and provided the foundations for major government initiatives including the provision of free early education for millions of two to four year olds. EPSI began in 1997, commissioned by John Major's Conservative government. The direction of EPSI was expanded and refocused by Labour after the election in 1997 to explore whether social inequalities could be tackled through early education. EPSI assessed more than 3,000 children, gathering data from birth and continue to monitor them until post-16. The findings showed a clear link between high quality uh, early education and, and improved outcomes, ameliorating some of the effects of social disadvantage. It also provided new evidence on the long-standing influence of the early home learning environment. 
balancing independent academic research with the requirements of policymakers played a large part in our work. And that's partly why it had such significant impact. From the very beginning, we focused resources on engaging policymakers, working alongside them closely and flexing the focus of research to suit their needs, whilst maintaining a rigorous and independent approach. We took part in discussion and debate, presented research in ways that made their findings and recommendations clear, from treasury to practitioners. We were also willing to engage with the media regularly to provide explanations and evidence of underpinning policy decisions. Building these strong relationships early uh, on allowed us to be in the room during the policy discussions, often advising on landmark changes Indeed, the idea of introducing free two-year-old provision was initiated in government by FC findings, especially for children from disadvantaged families. We weren't always able to influence, but we had a voice and could often persuade. When the free provision for two-year-olds was being discussed, EPSI's advice to Nick Clegg and Michael Gove on, on the importance of quality of early years provision was taken into account and providers were consequently required to be Ofsted good rated or higher. The longitudinal nature of EPSI allowed us to follow children to 16, producing extensive and rich data. As the studies progressed, we bid for extensions at 7, 11 and 14 with sub-studies along the way on pedagogy, on SEN and so on. Families were kept on board and engaged with regular newsletters, summer projects and competitions for children. Consistency, collaboration and communication among the researchers was key to maintaining focus across two decades. The use of both quantitative and qualitative data was also very important, allowing findings to be interrogated on multiple levels. This approach produced results that were useful to practitioners, policymakers and researchers alike. In the words of one professor from Columbia University, she said, EPSI's findings have transformed the global discussion on quality in young children's learning experiences. In the UK alone, spending on free early education has risen from very little in the 1990s to almost 4 billion in 2019. EPSI has had substantial international impact with our design and instruments used extensively elsewhere in the world. So to end, early education was a peripheral issue at the end of the 20th century and certainly not a major concern for the government. EPSI made the connection between early years education and attainment so clearly the policymakers began to take it seriously and increase access in hours. As continuing research studies have proven the power of high quality early education in reducing inequalities, it's become an integral part of government policy throughout the OECD. The challenge now for us is to improve the current expanded but still fragmented system, its workforce and curriculum and pedagogy to further align high quality to the increased quantity that young children so deserve. Thank you, Iran, for starting us off so well. It's really important research, which has been a benchmark against which others have sought to improve early years education. And now over to Guy Robert Holmes. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, Iram. And um, so I'd just like to build on uh, Iram's internationally um, important um, work in um, the early years education, particularly her findings on the importance of play uh, for young children's holistic development. Iram's work, of course, was extremely broad, um, but she, um, in particular, coined the term which many people are familiar with, sustained shared thinking, which is concerned with relational play pedagogies in both guided and unguided child-led play. So, and Iram's work actually stated that freely chosen play activities often provided the best opportunities for adults to extend children's thinking. And I hope you don't mind me quoting you there, Iram, but it's such an interesting uh, statement. So, um, so what I want to focus on here very briefly is what Iram and other early childhood scholars have demonstrated about the superior learning and motivation that arises from child-led playful guided and un 
guided um, learning, as opposed to direct instructional approaches to learning. So for example, pretend play supports children's early development of symbolic representational skills, including those of literacy, um, perhaps more powerfully than direct instruction does. So physical, intellectual, social, and emotional play supports children in developing their skills of self-regulation, which is absolutely critical to young children's early learning and development. So physical development and outdoor play, all of which are supported by Iram's work through the Early Years Foundation stage, are very important in stress management, physical coordination, physical confidence. Um, we know that play develops scientific thinking, curiosity, independent thinking, language and literacy skills. And play is crucial for social development, cooperation, negotiation, collaboration and socialization, all of which are increasingly needed by young children who many of whom have been isolated at home during the pandemic. So play is of even more central importance. And we know that play also enables children to practice and strengthen executive functions and metacognition, all of which actually boosts academic performance. So it's also important to say that play does not actually need measurable, testable, specific, uh, prescribed adult outcomes or goals, because it is the process and the act of playing itself which provides the benefit and the learning. So in conclusion, my research has shown that an increased focus on prescribed outcomes has actually led to a narrowed curriculum um, and more teacher-led instructional pedagogies um, and away from play and playful pedagogies. So my research questions this move towards an increasingly individualized, competitive performance management of young children, often using depersonalized data. And interestingly, even when its own terms of performance management, all the latest research from the EPI, Educational Policy Institute, and the SMC, the Social Mobility Commission, is suggesting that even prior to the, the pandemic, the attainment gap between disadvantaged and advantaged children was widening rather than narrowing. So finally, I would perhaps like to suggest that after the pandemic, we actually need to rethink the purposes of early years education once again. Um, it is, is it, for example, simply um, to produce school ready children who are able to rapidly acquire limited and narrow knowledge to perform in competitive primary school tests or could it, as an alternative, be that we want actually to rethink early years education as a much broader uh, termed, balanced, play-based curriculum that trusts teachers, children in their local communities and centers creativity, imagination, and happiness. Um, thank so, you very much. Thank you. Guy, that's a lovely introduction to some of the controversies involved in thinking about early years education. And we now pass on to Rachel Levy. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to be here. Nice to see you. So over, um, over the course of my career, which has included working as a primary school teacher and also as an academic conducting research with young children and their families, one thing that I feel I can say with some degree of certainty is that most parents and practitioners want what's best for children. And an important way in which to achieve this is for practitioners and parents to work together. But I would also argue that for some children, the domains of home and school can actually be so different that it can make it quite difficult for um, parents and practitioners to kind of understand each other and to work together. And this was something that I really did come to appreciate 
in my own research, which was understanding shared reading practices in the homes of preschool children. Now, five minutes clearly isn't long enough to talk about the results of a three year project. Um, but what I would like to say is that um, myself and my team, um, we interviewed families, most of whom live in disadvantage. And what we wanted to do was to understand their shared reading practices and the extent to which shared reading did or did not feature um, or didn't match with the context of their everyday lives. So I do have the findings um, written up into my book, which is here, which I don't think you can see because it's gone back to front, but um, Family Literacy is Reading with Young Children. But there's just one thing that I wanted to highlight from the project, and that was that the vast majority of parents, well, all of the parents in our study, they did read with their children, but they didn't, and this really ties in with what Guy was just saying, they didn't necessarily do it in a schooled way, but they did it in ways that fitted them and their own kind of family structures ways that suited them, the times of day that suited them. And in particular, for many of the parents in the study, the reasons, the motivations for reading with their children were simply because they enjoyed it. And they wanted to see that their children were enjoying it and getting something out of it. So just as a very brief example, I had one parent say, well, if I'm not going to enjoy it, I'm not giving 100%, then she's not good to enjoy it. So what's the point? I would not carry on reading. Parents also talked, almost all parents talked about reading being led by their children and how important it was to be led by their children. With somebody saying to me once, well, I'll carry on reading with her until she asks me not to. So again, it's not really about school and curriculum and targets, but it was about the, you know, the children and the families. So what I'm saying here is that for early childhood practitioners, it can be quite easy perhaps to think that parents might not read with their children because they don't understand the importance, literacy development and so forth. They don't have the time or, or perhaps, you know, we might feel as if they're just not supporting the school. And yet my research showed that that really is not the case. So these parents were, as I say, highly motivated to read with their children, but rather than doing it because they felt it was the right thing to do or for educational reasons, they did it because their children, children wanted to read and they themselves as parents needed to see that their children were getting something from it. And if that wasn't happening, then they wouldn't necessarily carry on reading. Now, I'm not gonna dwell anymore now on reading, but rather I'm making the point that this research gave me a really privileged position to really have an insight into an aspect of families' lives. And in, in doing so, I realised just how hard it can be for practitioners and parents to sometimes understand each other. So I'm not in any ways trying to suggest that ECE practitioners or parents, for that matter, don't get it right. But there are challenges. For example, over the years, I've spoken to a number of parents who've told me that they themselves didn't enjoy school, felt, you know, particularly in literacy, didn't enjoy reading aloud. You didn't feel as if school was a place that they particularly wanted to be. Also, some parents, you know, perhaps those from particular cultural backgrounds, just feeling as if the school discourse, the context is just not for them. And all of this is backed up by a large body of literature. So as I approach the end of this very short talk, I just want to say that this is clearly a complex topic, this whole idea of, of partnership between parents and, um, and practitioners. And yet, given the importance of the home context for a young child's development, it's really critical that we do find ways of listening to parents and understanding the unique context of individuals' lives and the individual lives of the children. And my final point is, having just come through the pandemic, as Guy was also talking about, we have just been handed this kind of perhaps unwelcome but very unexpected opportunity to work very differently with families. And um, so we did have this opportunity to really, for, you know, for, for practitioners to work with the families and for the families to be very central in education. So I just conclude that in order to develop future partnerships between ECE practitioners and parents, it's really important that we now take time to reflect on this and learn from the incredible ways in which schools did work with parents during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Sorry, I forget to unmute myself. We are now going to pass on to Trevor, 
Um, so that's going from thinking about partnerships between families and schools to some issues in leadership. Trevor. Thank you, Gemma. Um, my role is within the IOE is I work for the UCL Centre for Educational Leadership. And basically, I work across all phases of education. My first publication relating to early childhood education and care was back in 2012, now 10 years ago. At that time, I was trying to identify whether there's anything specific about the setting and the age range, which was different from general leadership issues, which are about being the formal or accountable leader of the setting and trying to reconcile the values, ethos and mission of that setting with external expectations. And most leaders in education are trying to exhibit a set of social behaviours which are seeking collective responses and leading down to operational leadership, in other words, being able to enact those values at the ground level. But setting a setting of accountability and performativity um, in all levels of education. And what makes it specific in early childhood education and care in England? I've done work in other countries, but in England particularly, that the formal leader, the person with the responsibility and accountability at the setting level, is actually working with many agencies in a multi-agency liaison and supervision sub, um, environment. And this leads to certain legal, moral and social expectations being expected at that level particularly in terms of EYFS, the Early Years Foundation stage, in terms of Ofsted approval and in terms of customer satisfaction, because most of the provision in this country is still at the level of being a market where people are buying into provision. There are approximately 60,000 providers of early childhood education and care in, in England, and of those, about just under half of them are in a situation of being either group-based providers or school-based providers. So they're very uh, interested in terms of making sure they're meeting the needs of the customers they serve. But the sector is dealt with inadequate funding, and there's stories that are coming out every week about how difficult it is to make these settings work, given the funding base and the demands on various parents and support agencies. And it leads to certain antinomies in the sector, which are specific to early childhood education and care. The first is the difference between education and care. Is the setting there to lead children's education or is it there to look after children? We've got a mixed economy in terms of the way in which the income comes into centres. We have a heavily gendered and low paid workforce, which contradicts other countries or convert, uh, compares to other countries is very poor. And we have certain ideological conflicts. Guy was talking, for example, about play based learning as opposed to instructional learning. So in the research and the publications I've produced since then, we've talked about the concept of praxis. And this is about the leader of the organization leading practice and combining knowledge, theory, craftsmanship, practical wisdom, and the taking of action. So we have a unified process. It's the notion of wise practice. In other words, we're selecting professional responses which are going to be appropriate to a given sort of context. So instead of saying there is one way of leading or one way of organizing or one way of delivering, it's about making the best choices according to the context in which we are. That's the concept of praxis. And then the last bit of my work is revolving around the notion of pedagogical leadership. And in here, amplifying what Rachel was saying, we're talking about the ecology of the community in terms of developing the learning environment in conjunction with other members of the community, not being a closed institution and opening up both in terms of the way in which we organize the learning and the way in which we relate to the other people within there, particularly the parents. So pedagogical leadership, to sum up as praxis, is rooted in its specific context and pays attention to the environment through engaging with its history, its culture, and the realities of the context in which we're involved. So in other words, pedagogical leadership as praxis is about delivering the most effective learning for the student body which you're serving. And that's the end of my presentation, thank you. 
Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, it's interesting to hear the variety of perspectives we're getting as we move through the panel. And can I just remind the audience to do pose your own questions of the panel using the Q&A function, which you will see at the bottom of the screen. And we will use that to open up more panel discussion uh, when we finish the presentations. Um, we've now moving on to Claire Crawford's work. Claire, would you like to tell us what matters to you about the early years? Thanks, Gemma. Um, well, I don't know whether it's what matters to me particularly, but I can certainly tell you um, a couple of things that I've learned from my research. Um, so we've heard quite a lot about the benefits of high quality early education for children so far today. Um, so I thought it was worth just taking a minute or so to highlight that our research suggests there are also benefits for parents as well, particularly for mothers. Um, so research that colleagues and I have done suggests that the availability of free or low cost childcare um, not only supports mothers' ability to work if they wish, um, with implications for family income, but it also has positive benefits for their mental health as well. So, for example, we found that the withdrawal of school and childcare support during the pandemic had the same detrimental effect on mothers' mental health as going through a divorce, for example, although it did rebound quickly once children were all able to return to care. So that suggests perhaps that the value for money case for high quality early education may want to be broadened to account for these wider benefits for families as well as for children. One of the things we've touched on a bit less so far today is the fact that um, high quality early education can also have greater benefits for children from disadvantaged backgrounds which as we've heard um, from previous speakers suggests that it could have a, an important role to play, not only in terms of increasing school readiness, but also more generally to helping narrow gaps in development between children from different backgrounds. But there are at least two aspects of the current system that may be preventing these benefits from being realized. The first is the fact that, at least at the moment in England, children from more advantaged backgrounds are entitled to more subsidised care than children from less advantaged backgrounds. So, for example, amongst three and four year olds, those in working families um, in which parents could earn up to £100,000 per year each are entitled to 30 hours of free care per week in term time, as compared to 15 hours for, per week for all three and four year olds. So obviously the cost of um, childcare and early education is going to be problematic for some families, there's no denying that, but essentially this policy ends up being an income transfer to many wealthier families, um, which obviously doesn't help us reduce those inequalities um, through this policy lever. The second is the fact that children from more disadvantaged backgrounds are often the least, like, least likely to take up these early education entitlements. And actually the pandemic seems to have made this worse. So for example, in January, 2020, just before the pandemic hit, less than 70% of those two-year-olds who are entitled to um, a free place for 15 hours a week, they are dis from disadvantaged backgrounds. Less than 70% of those took it up and the pandemic seems to have led to a big drop in take up, falling to just over 60% a year later in January, 2021. We await the 2022 figures with interest to see whether that has uh, been eliminated or has continued to remain below expectation. Take up amongst three year olds has also fallen and some new research will be releasing shortly, which looks at the impact of the pandemic on early education, early childhood education and care, both attendance and provision more generally, suggests it's fallen more in areas with lower female activity rates, for example, in more disadvantaged areas. So for our early education system to be playing that important role in reducing inequalities, which we think it could be playing, I think we need to be giving serious consideration to a rebalancing of funding away from childcare subsidies focused on wealthier working families and towards high quality early education for children from disadvantaged backgrounds. We also need to redouble our efforts to ensure that high, that high take up of the entitlements on offer are evident amongst children from all backgrounds. Thanks very much. Thank you, Claire. That's some really useful information about the funding climate at the moment and the impact it has on uptake 
um, in ways that perhaps policymakers need to pay more attention to. We can see some questions are coming in right now, but please keep them coming. I'm going to turn to the last panelist and contributor, uh, and that's Dominic Wise. Thanks, Gemma. Uh, <clears throat> and thank you, everyone. I'm struck by the, the breadth of what makes early years as a topic of research so important and as a practical reality. Before I give a couple of examples from my own work, I just want to mention something which perhaps doesn't get mentioned about early years research or indeed other areas of research. And this is the role of leadership, particularly heads of departments in universities. And of course, today I'm talking about the Department of Learning and Leadership. And I just, just to name a few colleagues uh, going back from when I joined, having been at the University of Cambridge, Graham Welsh, who's an ex-primary teacher and specialist in music, Sue Rogers, of course, whose uh, focus is very much early years and who ultimately became the interim director of, of the IOE. Uh, and also uh, we have um, Gemma today. Uh, thank you, Gemma, for being the interim head of department. We have Lynn Ang, who had her term and before, before Lynn, in fact, I had my own term as head of department. And I suppose one of the things I'm proud of is how we work together to bring together the old department called Early Years and Primary Education with what is now the London Centre for Leadership in Learning, led by Chingu. Optimum pedagogy is essential for early years education, and my major research activity includes being founding director of the Helen Hamlin Centre for Pedagogy. The aim of the research centre is to have a positive impact on early years and primary children through exemplary pedagogy, pedagogy. So, for example, our work on children's agency in the curriculum is already becoming influential. But I'm perhaps more known, even more known, for the teaching of early language and literacy. Um, and so, just to give an example that's, that's still in mind because of the, the slight shock of finding that Alice Bradbury and I, who were on the front page of The Guardian, for a while knocking off party gate. Um, and this was on the basis of what we didn't think was too controversial. It was a research paper, admittedly a, a long one, a detailed one based on uh, a year or so of work um, where we were looking at the teaching of reading and in particular, the teaching of phonics and reading. And there's a very recent uh, TES piece, brilliant piece, I think, uh, written by the journalist, Helen Amas, called How Phonics Became an Education Culture War. Um, and she, Helen interviewed us, but also lots of other leading scholars in, and, and practitioners in relation to the teaching of reading. But I think it's a really unusual journalistic piece and deserves wider reading. Uh, similar media attention came recently through the publication of our report on grammar and writing. And I want to pay tribute to the whole research team, including DLL colleagues Jake Anders, Sue Singh, Alistair Gennaro, Jana Manukina, and IOE and UCL colleagues Baz Arts and Julie Dockrell. I've always been interested in, in the engagement between or the connections between research and teachers, practitioners, and policymakers. And just to give a different kind of example of a work that comes out of my research. My book with colleagues called Teaching English Language and Literacy has been a best-selling text for more than 10 years. And we've started work on the fifth edition. And incidentally, the, the arc and the trajectories of policy change, which is features in one chapter in the book, it was fascinating. I went back to the first edition and it's quite shocking in some ways how, how policy has continued to change in, in some positive ways and in some quite negative ways. And I'm also currently a lead author with Andrew Pollard on a new edition of Reflective Teaching, which for first time for a long time will go back to having a special primary education version. And to finish my five minutes today, I just want to emphasize the links between practice and research, how important these are for early years education, but I would go further and say for education as an academic discipline in universities. I speak to you early morning in San Diego. Unfortunately, I woke up at four due to the sleep patterns being disrupted. Uh, I'm doing two symposia here, and one of these is called Back to the Rough Ground and is exploring practitioner inquiry, including my work on close to practice research 
and its links with education as an academic discipline. The discussant is Marilyn Cochrane Smith. And as BIRA president for, for a few more months, I'm proud to have led on BIRA rejoining the World Education Research Association after a gap of more than 10 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dom. That is a very good roundup of the breadth of interest there is in early years in the Department of Learning and Leadership. Um, I'm delighted to see the questions still coming in, and this is now the Q&A part of the event. Uh, Sarah Bubb is going to um, pick up on some questions that have come in on the Q&A chat and will be posing them at our panel. Uh, some of them may be directed at individuals. I can see quite a lot of concern coming in around the policy environment for early years, around some of the funding issues and how we can make a high quality nursery provision that really does reach the most disadvantaged. So, Sarah, if you would like to come in and uh, bring one of the questions from the Q&A, that would be great. Thank you, thank you Gemma, and thank you to all the panellists for such interesting topics. Um, there are several questions around play in the current, um, current context. So um, the importance of play in supporting child development um, versus the instructional view, it's more important than ever. So how do we counter the current sort of government-led uh, view of um, early years and foundation stage practice to make sure that play and care are central to provision in early years? Iram, I'm wondering if you would like to come in on that. I think that um, uh, a lot of practitioners are taking uh, a strong lead in ensuring that children do get uh, appropriate environments and play routines where they can express themselves and uh, engage in um, different types of play, be it sociodramatic and so on. I think there has been a push down tendency. And I think that, um, I don't fully accept that um, uh, there is only in, in, in preschools uh, a push to uh, in, instructional teaching. Um, I also don't think a completely free play um, uh, environment is uh, appropriate for children who perhaps haven't had um, adult extension and support. There is a great deal of evidence, particularly for emergent literacy, early literacy, that certain play routines are better for children than um, uh, completely free play, for instance, where um, adults can uh, engage in dialogic reading, where they can engage in cookery, scientific activities, where there's a lot of what we call experiential and exploratory work going on by children. Other people call it play, and some people call it guided learning. I think this new early years foundation stage curriculum has gone uh, more the other way to try and get adults to think about the adult role because there wasn't sufficient um, uh, focus on the adult role in the past. But we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Play is central to children's learning, but not all play leads to learning. So adults have to have a significant role and balance play with um, uh, support for uh, guiding children's um, interests and learning as well. Thank you, Iram. I wonder if I can bring Guy in on this. And following on from Iram, Guy, I'm wondering about the role of adult talk in child play, extending cognition and, and, and bringing benefits around a play agenda. Guy, would you like to come in on that? Well, um, oh, thanks very much. And it's, I, I think Iram's um, mentioned this, this, the push down tendency. And I think that is what we have seen, um, particularly 
for, for example, with the introduction of reception baseline assessment, which is actually pushed down to the early years now, and will once again increase the emphasis on a on a very narrow curriculum. So, and that's from central government. So I think what we, as Iram suggested, is trust teachers, practitioners far more than we currently do. The government's incredibly tight regulation and governance stifles creativity and imagination of practitioners, um, which is often play-based, child-led, as Iram's work has, has acknowledged in very sensitive and intelligent ways. And we need spaces and agency in which that can occur far more readily than it currently than it currently does does that help answer yes thank you guy you're you're restating the case for play i'm wondering if trevor has something to say on this from his perspective on optimum pedagogy and what is the role of the leader in this context if guy is right and there is a big push um, how can the kind of negotiated dialogic space that Iran is speaking up for be found? And well, sadly, it's, it's at the individual level. It's down to the individual setting and the leader within them to protect the internal processes from the external environment, which is oppressive in terms of suppressing play in terms of school readiness. So it's a hard road to walk as a leader because you've got to stay, tread between those expectations and the ramifications for not following those expectations. And they have to find a way of being what I would call, which it may not work in other countries, squeaky clean. If they've got a good report, if they are being held in high esteem, both by the community and by the people who decide about the level of provision, particularly Ofsted, then they can do more things of their own volition rather than what's expected of them in the legislation or the expectations are all about preparing for school. Thank you very much. Well, you will have heard the range of views on the panel uh, on the question about play and its place in the early years curriculum. Sara, would you like to pick another theme from the questions that have been posed from the audience and perhaps take us in another direction? Uh, yes, and thank you. Thank you very much for all these questions that are coming in. Um, what do the panel think should be the priorities for the next five to 10 years? I'm looking to my panelists to come in. I'm going to ask Claire, actually. <laughs> Claire, do you think that you can see from your analysis of the data, do you have an answer for priorities for the next five to 10 years? Um, well, I touched on them in my answer from a funding perspective. I think it's if we want early education to play a role in reducing inequalities, then we should definitely be rebalancing funding away from higher income working families and towards those from more disadvantaged backgrounds. It's also um, would definitely be on my list that we need to address the funding rate that is paid to providers to cover the so-called free hours of early education that children are entitled to. Um, the government's own figures suggested that it wasn't sufficient to cover the true cost of care in many cases. That's clearly not a desirable or sustainable um, position and should be addressed. Um, not by changing the ratios as seems to be on the kind of policy cards at the moment, but instead by investing seriously in high quality early education. It can have big benefits for children. Those benefits seem to last into the long term. I think there's a clear economic case for greater investment as well as a kind of um, equality or social fairness perspective as well. Um, so I think redressing those balances would certainly be on my agenda for the government to try and tackle over the next five to 10 years, whether the appetite is there to do that, I think is a much more debatable question. I'm going to ask Iram if she could come back in on this question, particularly on persuading government to invest and investing in high quality in the areas where it's needed. Iram, I'm turning to you because in your initial comments, you made very clear how much time and effort you and the EPI and EPSI team had put into actually talking to policymakers. 
what do you make of the chances of, of persuading the right kind of investment to flow to the early years right now? Well, the, the investment that has gone in um, has been largely around access and expansion. Um, and I know that um, quality hasn't had the same kind of push because it's more expensive, even more expensive. And although um, EPI and SEED and now uh, uh, and the Millennium Cohort Study and various other longitudinal studies have shown the benefit of early learning and a lot of money has gone into accessing um, early learning for children, partly to support um, families to uh, more of them to go out to work. There's been a tension between, as Andreas Schleiper at OECD says, between access and quality. And I think the quality has lost out. We haven't really had a full debate. And I think the Institute of Education of the last 50 years has been a leading institute in uh, initiating that debate of where we should go. And currently, I think we're going in the wrong direction. We're going towards further fragmentation, more privatization, but it's not the case across the UK. I work closely with Wales and I work closely with Scotland where, where uh, the market sector is shrinking and there's a bigger role for government in supporting quality. Um, and that means taking uh, the, the um, variation in salaries seriously. You know, we're not all poorly paid. There are some very well paid uh, head teachers and senior staff in early years. And then we have a pyramid, you know, where at the bottom you have a huge number of very poorly paid people. Uh, and there is fragmentation ideologically within the sector as to where uh, how we improve things. For instance, when a minister suggested that early year staff should have GCSEs in English and maths, which I think is pretty critical, this was criticized by leading early childhood authorities to say that um, you didn't really need to be academic, as if GCSEs are academic, to work with young children. And this constant dumbing down of what we need um, requires a paradigmatic shift on the part of people in both uh, government um, and uh, further education and higher education to what we need. We need to, uh, the, the pedagogy we're talking about, the pedagogy um, Guy and Trevor are talking about is one of the most complicated pedagogies you can have in education. And yet we have sometimes the least prepared workforce because we're not investing sufficiently in it. We have fantastic people in the early years who would be capable of doing much, much more given the opportunities. So there's a question in the um, uh, participants about two-year-olds and whether, you know, uh, going for a good setting has actually hijacked two-year-old provision. Well, I would arg argue strongly against that. Um, one of the things we talked to Nick Clegg and Michael Gove about was to not have the two-year-old provision because we, we only in EPSI found that high quality, mostly excellent settings were making a difference to more disadvantaged children coming in early at two, not before two, and that it should be really high quality settings. But it was seen as an electoral you know, um, winner to, to go just for good. So I think, I think it, 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 things are complex and we need to invest in less better policies uh, rather than, um, you know, a range of other things. So for instance, I've recently written a blog for um, the Sutton Trust on the 30 year issue that Claire raised, which is such an important issue, sorry, the 30 hour issue for disadvantaged families who are not getting access to that. If you are working full time looking after a disabled adult or a child, or you have domestic abuse in your house, you are not getting the provision and entitlement uh, to uh, 30 hours for your children. Uh, and I think um, this government's policies are very, very mixed and counter 
productive in many ways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iram. Um, I can see other panellists nodding as you were talking about that, and it, it clearly is a complex area and, and one which requires a bit more crucial attention than maybe it's getting. Sarah, we have time for another topic if you can bring one into the discussion. Brilliant. This one's uh, very appropriate to our department because we train so many uh, new teachers uh, and leaders. So this question is, how should we address training and qualifications for those working and leading in the early years? What should the priorities be? If a panellist would like to pick this up, please go for it. If somebody doesn't leap to unmute, I'm going to ask Dom to start us off. Thank you, Gemma. <clears throat> um, I think for me, it's about um, much more consistent provision overall of early years. So, and I defer actually to other panellists and the comments that have already been made, but uh, I think the fragmentation is particularly problematic and we're not alone in that worldwide. I think the levels of, I think Iram's point about the, the sort of um, GCSE uh, sort of war that arose, um, I, I think it's not helpful. I think that is a sort of a culture war. And I agree that it's very important that all people who work with young children um, are as well qualified as we can possibly afford to do. If I may just dip back to the, um, what shall we do in the next five to 10 years, I mean, I think absolutely we need to revisit um, things like the early years foundation stage, and I know some people's hearts may sink, but also the, the national curriculum, um, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, to have a really sensible dialogue between policymakers, practitioners, researchers, about how we can evolve. Um, and, and I speak as someone who's working closely with uh, Ireland at the moment, they're doing extraordinary things in the way they are approaching uh, reform of their primary curriculum. So, sorry, I've gone slightly off message there, but I hope that's uh, helpful to some degree. I can jump in. I just think one of the, the problems we have is the economics of this, that it's not an attractive career option for people coming into early childhood education. Um, and even if we're training people at the moment as early years qualified teacher status, they're finding it very difficult to find employment at the end of it. And although we've had various options in the past of things like the national uh, qualification for integrated centre leadership, and we've had early years professional status, none of this has really impact on the centre because at the end of the day, we're not affording the salary cost that's going to attract the best people to lead this provision. One of the things I'd like to sort of ask, because I don't know myself the answer, is what's the correlation between a lack of investment in early childhood and the costs of prison care, for example, in adulthood? Because I think it's more expensive. So I don't think it wants to comment on that. Claire, would you want to come in on that one? Um, well, there's certainly evidence from the US that very highly intensive um, investments in early years can reduce costs in adulthood, including with crime and other things. That comes from things like the Perry Preschool Project, which was focused on very disadvantaged groups um, in the kind of 60s and 70s. It's, it's much more intensive than we would think of typically as the early education experience that most children would receive here, but there is good evidence that even that kind of um, intervention can support positive outcomes in adulthood. So I think there are, there is good evidence of significant long-term benefits of this kind of early intervention. I think that has to form part of the case for investment in the early years. There clearly are benefits that persist and we should be banging that drum as much as we can, I, I, get, I suspect. Could I just add, Gemma, very briefly that, as colleagues have said, I mean, I think the answer here is we need an, a public system, a comprehensive public system of early years education, because the fragmentation, if anything, is getting worse rather than better. So, you know, we have 50% of practitioners in privatised settings claiming benefits because their income doesn't make... so. As, I, as we need to move towards, for example, Sweden's 1.6% of GDP on early years education to have a, a coherent 
um, integrated public system as is the case with primary education. It should be, uh, it shouldn't be um, so privatized as Iram and others have said in England and other countries are working towards that. But unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case in England. Thank you. I'm wondering if any other panelists have any concluding remarks to make. I certainly, having listened to the discussion, I think what has become abundantly clear is the need for investment in the early years and investment in quality, not just quantity, um, and how one gets back to that. I am reminded of Iram's work on the EPI project because it did produce very clear indicators of what makes for quality provision and bringing that back into the agenda. Um, it, it's always hard to do, I think, but I, I, I certainly think the panel is making a case for investing in the quality and skills of those trained to work in early years settings, which of course is part of what our department tries to do. I'm gonna say thank you very much for all of the contributions that have been made both by the panelists themselves and also the many questions that came into the question and answer function. I know we've not been able to answer all of them individually um, and we've dealt with them in themes. Um, the event itself, you can follow us on Twitter at IOE underscore London using the hashtag IOE 120. The recording will be transcribed and then posted and we've just put the link in uh, the chat, I think, so that everybody can see it. And with this is one of a number of events that the IOE is um, holding over this time. And we do hope that we can encourage public conversation on what matters in education, both for the early years and for older age groups. It's been a privilege to chair this event and to hear the discussion that's gone on. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a very good evening.